sir, this is a short case. Uh, this is a case of a 36 year old male patient from Kolkata who is a serviceman by occupation. Presented with symptoms of hostess of voice, which develops gradually over 6 to 7 months. Patient also complains of respiratory distress, which is intermittent in nature, not related to any change in posture. Uh, patient also gives a history of radiation 6 months back. This patient is hypertensive since 7 years on telecertain 40 mg. Uh, patient also gives a history of, uh, patient was a smoker for almost 20 years but left 2 years back. Uh, his max score is more than 4, average weight, however the patient gives history of weight loss. Yes. Uh, sir, this respiratory process, first of all, it is not, it is not permanent. Sir, we are not able to hear, sir. Sir, we are not able to hear. I am sorry, sir. Huh? No, we are debating that he has told me that the patient has a med score of 4. Right? And in the presenting complaint, he tells me that since 6 to 7 months, the patient has respiratory distress. How can a patient with respiratory distress have med score of more than 2? Sir, uh, uh, sir, that respiratory distress, first of all, it is not permanent in nature. As for the patient, it if is you See, whenever you do some sort of small, mild exercise, your respiratory rate and volume, everything increases. You are able to climb stairs, yes. isn't it? You think a patient with a constriction can climb stairs or would have a med score of four? If he has respiratory distress, whether it is postural or at any time, you think he will be able to do that? However, the patient gives special... No, I am just... You have to question him more. You have to be more uh, diligent and ask him. What exactly specify what problem he has? Look, <coughs> he has said to me that uh, he has some... I mean, uh, breathlessness sometimes. Uh, but it is not related to any activity. And he said he, whenever he is sitting, so at that time... So you change the respiratory uh, distress to so some difficulty in breathing. It will be respiratory distress. Okay. We can easily say that we are not able to assess it. So, but if a patient is history that he is able to that means before. that means you have not detailed. We gone into the history to ask him what you are able to walk to the bathroom. You can always make him walk. What's the problem? If you have any doubt in his med scoring and walking distance, tell him to. Come walk with me for 10 minutes, 5 minutes around down the lake. He's completely mobile. If he has met score of 4, why can't he walk with you? Tell him to come and walk up, uh, up, climb up, up flight of stairs and see what happens to him. So you can do those things. But uh, this way it looks uh, drastically different. See, we are having a patient with uh, laryngeal problem, correct? And that's what the short case is. So when you talk about airway examination specifically, please be more detailed in your airway examination. Give all the parameters which you have, everything should be detailed. You can't say airway normal in a short case when you're discussing about airway problem, right? So, okay, what all, how would you do the airway examination? Let's begin from that. Uh, sir, uh, his mouth opening was more than three centimeters. Uh, uh, the uh, modified malampati reading is uh, grade two. Uh, then. Uh, 
So the thyroid mental distance is uh, is more than 6.5 centimeters. It's approximately almost 6.5 centimeters. Inspection of the submandibular space uh, and also the face, the general inspection of the face is also done in the area of the airway transmission. And range of movements, mobility of the neck. Anything else you would like to do extra in this patient? Something which you cannot see, but you have to assess. Indirect laryngoscopy. Indirect laryngoscopy they are getting. But in when you are taking the history, when you are talking to the patient, would you do certain other maneuvers to know about the problem which he has? <coughs> would you like to see whether the patient has hoarseness? What has happened to the pitch? Whether he can speak loud or he squeaks when he speaks loud? Right? Ask the patient to swallow whether he coughs during eating. Is he aspirating? Because when you have an airway pathology, especially in laryngo, uh, laryngo uh, CA larynx, any of the uh, vocal cords may be paralyzed. And if the vocal cord is para paralyzed, he will be frequently coughing. Is he able to take liquids? They will not be able to take liquids properly at times. At times they can. They will not be able to swallow well at times. So swallowing has to be assessed. His weight loss has to be assessed, whether he is able to eat properly or not. You have to ask him whether he frequently wakes up coughing in the night. And that is because there is a silent aspiration which is occurring and he is suddenly waking up because the saliva goes inside. What posture he opts? Does he sleep, does he sleep well when he is a little bit, when his head is a little bit raised? Because then he will not have uh, more of uh, aspiration. Correct? So these things have to be assessed in a little more detail. And hoarseness, you have to give us a little history from when onwards the hoarseness has developed. Has it become more worse? So has it become, has it progressed or it has remained the same? It has remained the same. What kind of movements you would like to a patient to say? What kind of vowels you would like the patient to speak? to assess what is happening to the mobility. If you have to assess voice quality, you generally do two tests. One is patient says ah, the other is e. Both lead to abduction. But one leads to hyper abduction, one leads to moderate abduction. So you have to see which voice is more effective. Is it the lim limitation which is occurring there? Right? So voice and swallowing, these both things have to be assessed. You know, you cannot leave it like this. When you are talking to patients, a lot of assessment has to be made. Ask him to cough. Why do you want him to ask him to cough? What are you going to assess when you ask him to cough? <coughs> yes? Ability, ability, to pierce ability how do you, how do you, how does CA larynx uh, translate into ability to clear secretions? How is cough generated? Against huh? a closed glottis. Closed glottis. So the glottis has to close. So if he is able to close the glottis, he will be able to cough. So once you ask him to cough, you will be able to make out whether it is a hollow cough or it is brassy cough or it is he is not able to close or it is only a husky cough. That means he is not able, the cords are not approximating, they are fixed, they are not adapting, he is not able to cough. So there should be a problem, you would probably look at an x-ray chest, you will look at those things properly. So history-wise, these things have to be assessed to a great extent to know the problems of the airway and the chest and what we are dealing with. Correct? And you have not told us anything about the lymph nodes. With CA larynx, there may be a lot of lymph adenopathy which, which can accompany the patient. They can have compressive symptoms also. Uh, sir, the eating pattern of a patient was normal. The liquid was not. It has to come in history, my dear. It has to come. Because we do not know you would have elicited, but until unless you tell us, how do we know you will ask for it?
part in the Any investigations you will do? Uh, I will proceed first of all with the uh, routine blood investigation like hemoglobin, total count, platelet, uh, then followed by the chest x-ray. As the patient is uh, 66 years old uh, and also hypertensive, then ECG. And I also like to do eco also in this patient. Anything related to a CLR in CO2? One thing I've already told you yes, that we have to do a low idea. Volume, low, 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 low volume loops you can do, you have to do a idea. You will have to do an X-ray chest definitely. Yeah, X-ray neck definitely, right? Okay. What do you want to if I give you an X-ray neck as an anesthetist, what do you like to assess in an X-ray neck? Or a CT neck someone was telling you. Uh, the mobility of the C is fine. In extreme, in extreme, take, take the mic there. The, there are two mics there. I think both of them are fine. It's functioning, man. I was able to hear you. Speak. No, it's functioning. Keep, keep it here in between so that you both can share it up. Tracheal deviation and the amount of soft tissue in front of the larynx. Okay. So you want to know what is the tracheal deviation. Deviation doesn't matter much. You are always able to negotiate the terms. What matters is the diameter of the trachea. So you think there will be a problem in the trachea? Cervical trachea. What's the, uh, from where to which part of the, what's the length and from which vertebra to which vertebra the cervical trachea goes? So you think there will be a problem in cervical trachea somewhere with X-ray, with similarities? It's an arranged group. So what would you like to assess as far as constriction of the supraglottic and the glottic structures are concerned? Trachea will not be affected. So I would like to do the FOL, fiber optic laryngoscopy or the DLScopy when it comes to the ENT. Yes. So they would like to do a, they normally do a endoscopic examination with the fiber optic. See what the image of the, of the whole thing is there. They will do a CT to see the extent, the lower extent of the growth, the sideways extents of the growth, whether it is involving the vallicula, it is going to the parapharyngeal structures, is it going posteriorly towards the cord or towards the esophagus. So those structures, they will definitely do a CT. So your only problem in CA larynx is that you will have constriction at the larynx. That's the problem. Trichia is essentially not a It doesn't affect the trachea. Because tracheostomy, most of them would have a tracheostomy. So it is always a glottic obstruction and the supraglottic area which is more friable to injury and to other things, secretions which are lodged there. So trachea, not right, but glottis, yes, you want to know details about the glottis. So the best way to do is get a CT done and do a fiber optic to see what is the state. Ask the patient to phonate. They will do a telelaryngoscopy and see all those things and tell you. But they would draw diagrams there. Don't go by those diagrams. Tell them to show you. Or you do it yourself. So when you have to assess the glottis in a CA larynx, don't be misled but what diagrams have been drawn in the case sheet. Or what pictures are there. They may put the pictures, but they are all static pictures. They don't give you much of information. You need to put the scope there and with the ENT surgeon or by yourself, see what is happening to the glottis. Tell him to swallow, tell him to phonate, see whether the cords are approximating or not. See what is covering the glottis. Is it a small polypoid growth which is going inside the glottis and coming out? Is it fixed? It is dynamic, mobile? So all that assessment of the growth pattern has to be done by a fiber optic or a telelaryngoscopic examination done with the patient awake, not only just seeing the pictures, which are very misleading. So that's the word of caution I want to give you. Anytime you want to handle a CA larynx. For laryngectomy, it will not be a problem. But for direct laryngoscopy and biopsy is the biggest problem. 
For laryngectomy, they will do a tracheostomy. If you want a pre-op tracheostomy, no problem. They will do it if the patient has tried it. Or they will say, okay, if you are able to intubate, intubate, later on we will convert it to a tracheostomy. Your problems are more or less solved. But if the same patient, let's say, comes for direct laryngoscope. So we will change the case. Now this patient comes for direct laryngoscopy for biopsy of the growth. Now what will you do and how would you manage this case? before they go for laryngectomy. So we are changing the case. Laryngectomy is fairly simple. But this is a small procedure and it is fairly complicated and more challenging. Sir, I think there is a plan. My plan will be seen. Uh, I will go for awake intubation only, sir, because they have to take the biopsy and they don't know the nature of the mark. So I will intubate the patient. Awake intubation. Five optic guided awake intubation. Because we don't know the nature of the mass. If they take out the biopsy. You want to know what the nature of the mass is before you decide on that. Say, as Sir was saying, there's a small polyp like growth on one of the vocal cords. It's a very small one, say around 0.5 to 1 centimeter. Do you want to do an awake intubation? I think yes, ma'am. Or you have another mass which is very large, the pyriform fossa and all has growth, everywhere there is an obstruction. So what makes you decide whether you want to go for an awake intubation or an anesthetized intubation? What, what determines the choice? What is the size of the mass? What is the most important thing about induction of anesthesia you are worried about here? Losing the air. So it shouldn't cause complete airway obstruction. So that you need to decide based on your symptoms and video laryngoscopic picture of the mass. So you tell us your options. I want to know what your options are. This patient has respiratory distress. Okay, so let us say there is a soft tissue mark in the pyriform fossa involving that area. One of the cords is fixed and the lotic aperture is compromised. Right? Okay? So that's the telelaryngoscopic picture which they have shown you with the patient awake. Now they want to do a biopsy from that mass. Patient will not cooperate. They want a good chunk. Initial FNSC is non-conclusive. They want a bigger mass, bigger chunk of tissue to get you the proper histopath report. So how would you anesthetize? Pre-medication, anesthesia, recovery. You said awake. Right? You still I, I stick by your stand? Yes, How would you do awake intubation? Uh, so first of all, I will explain the whole procedure to the patient, take the consent from the patient. And sir... Uh, 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 Under awake, what is your choice? Are you going to do an awake direct laryngoscopy, an awake video laryngoscopic intubation, an awake fiber optic guided intubation? So in under awake, what's your choice? Awake fiber optic guided intubation. Uh, after after giving the supralangeal dog and the transtracheal so one, one at a time. So we start with pre-med. So your plan is awake fiber optic awake intubation of this patient. What what are the drugs you want to give before you start? Uh, um, I will I will give the uh, <coughs> lignocaine two percent. I will avoid the medical. Anything you want to do before the Do you like to give an antisyllable? Why? And not only that, you said you want to give lignocaine. Ma'am, uh, like I would give a nebulization with a, a lignocaine. So, do you give glycoperlate before or after? Before. Why? So, so, the time of action is around 15 to 20 minutes. A dry mucosa is likely to take up your lignocaine better. better. It will act better. Otherwise, it will get washed away by yourself by the secretion. So, you always have to give antisalivar <coughs> before, especially if you are giving using techniques which are vision based like video laryngoscopy or fiber optic microscopy, okay? So glycopyrrolate. Next is what? What steroid do you want to give and why you are going to give it? Hydrocortisone. Why? It prevents laryngeal edema. Okay. 
you want to use dexmedetomidum? Why do you want to use dexmedetomidum? Sedation of the patient can be doesn't cause a loss of airway. This patient is in respiratory distress. Ma'am, uh, if, if I'm planning a awake fiber update, uh, first uh, I'll also do a, a xylocaine viscous jelly gargle to the patient. Uh, then I'll secondly go for an nebulization also uh, with lignocaine. See, 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 this plan is a fiber optic intubation. So what are the nerves that you have to be blocked? Do you need an oral viscous gargle for a nasal fiber optic? Or you're planning an oral fiber optic? No, nasal fiber optic. So what are, what are your nerves to be blocked? Uh, Ma'am, first of all, I will uh, give the spray, nasal, nasal lignocaine spray, uh, followed by the Supralangeal nerve block as well as a transtracheal so and also uh, no, maybe the spectrum. So, can you block the anterior esmodal nerve and greater and lesser palatine nerve for a nasal intubation? Greater and lesser palatine have to be blocked for your nasal intubation. How are you going to block these? So, let's go very far back. Yeah, for the nasal cavity, you just you can just place pledges or pregnocaine. You want to add something else to that? Something to vasoconstrict, either phenylephrine, oxymetazole, or adrenaline. Okay, and how will you pack? Is there any specific way of packing so that the nerves you want to block are blocked? You have to make sure that the gauze is, yeah, it is not only, it's one goes towards the roof and one is towards the base. So the entire nasal cavity is. So it's not just, you have to make sure it reaches the posterior nares and the roof of the nasal cavity, okay? If you're going to nebulize, you, do you also have to pack? You can just use drops of any vasoconstrictor and then nebulize. Okay, nebulization, what percentage lignocaine do you use? So what are all the preparations of lignocaine that's available? Which percent is what? Liquid. Four percent is? Ma'am, 2% is liquid, 10% is a, a spray. 10% spray is there. Anything else? Any other preparation is there? Viscous gargle is what percent? Jelly is there. You need to know all preparations of lignocaine that is available for use. And use them appropriately depending on this oral or nasal, whichever part has to be blocked. And then how do you do? Go ahead, tell us how you do the procedure. See, uh, whenever you decide about how to manage an airway, there are two questions you must ask yourself. <coughs> based on which you will form and formulate your technique. First is, is it safe to put the patient to sleep? Is it safe to put this patient to sleep? He doesn't sleep every day. He's awake <coughs> for six to seven months. He sleeps. He sleeps well. Huh? That's where your history comes. So you have to tell me whether you can put this patient to sleep. First thing. Second thing is whether we need to preserve spontaneous ventilation or we do not need to preserve. Or we can paralyze. These are the two mandatory questions which you must ask yourself. The third question is is it a difficult airway or is it a compromised airway? Compromised airway means that the patient is already in obstruction. And if it is a compromised airway, you cannot put the patient to sleep. And you cannot knock off his respiration. So is this a compromised airway? <coughs> to an extent. But he is able to sleep. Maybe it is not completely obstructing the Maybe when he takes a deep breath, he has difficulty in breathing. He may not be able to take a deep breath. So the guide here is what you see through the telelaryngoscope. How big is your glottic aperture? 
Are you able to see the glottic aperture completely? Where is the growth located? Is it below the arytenoids? It is above in the anterior commissures. It is in the, uh, I mean, in the pyriform fossa. Where is it located? So the location, site, extent of glottic involvement. Is the glottis free? It's only in the pyriform fossa. Then what's the problem? So everything, all your management would be based on what you see through the teledialidoscope. That will tell you how what you have to do. Some patients would come with strider. CLRN, some of them will come with strider. They cannot lie straight. And you will be called for a tracheostomy assistance. But this patient, he doesn't have those problems. So to my ex to, to what you have presented to us, met for uh, very occasional difficulty in some way or the other, he may be having, maybe when he's taking a deep breath, but we were not able to take detailed history. I would pr rather put him to sleep. Correct? I can put him to sleep. Even if the mask is that's what I'm telling you. If I look at the mask with telelaryngoscopy and the history which you have given me, then we will decide. We can't arbitrarily decide. So if you would have put a picture here, then I would have told you what you should be doing. But now we are assuming a lot of things. So when the assumption is based on what you have presented to me, I feel I can put this patient to sleep. I don't have to go for awake procedures. It's an overkill. You can't do it, keep doing that for all patients where you assume there is a difficulty. So it has to be scientifically based and on your examination that you decide what to do. So based on what you have told us, I would prefer that we put this patient to sleep. If I am a little scared, not really knowing it, I will use an inhalational agent, oxygen fluorine, and see how we maintain his, just maintain his respiration. And if he is obstructing at any point, let us see if the upper airway obstruction can be taken care of. Maybe put a nasopharyngeal airway. Just take him up into a deep uh, anesthesia. Right? In that itself, you can do a scopy. With a video laryngoscope, they can just take a pinch off. Normally, we intubate with sevoflurane also without a relax. So at times, you will just deepen the anesthetic plane with your inhalational anesthesia. Maintain the airway with the mask and then give the patient, let them do a scopy and take out the mask. If the surgeon is experienced within two minutes, the job is over. Within one minute, it will be over. But if you have someone who is not really experienced, it is likely to bleed, the mask is very friable, all that information you will get when you look at the mask. So if the mask is friable, you feel there is going to be sufficient bleeding and it will take some time to achieve hemostasis and all those things, then intubate. But fiber optic for intubation in compromised airway in supraglottic pathology is very challenging. You will not be able to intubate. Take it from me. With video laryngoscope, you may be able to. But with fiber optic, to get to the mass, guide across the mass, look at these structures there. And if the glottic opening is small, you put the fiber optic through that small hole, patient would be totally obstructed. Imagine he's having this much hole, and that also the fiber optic is occupying now. Where is he going to breathe from? So the moment you touch there and go inside, he will go into complete obstruction. Saturation will fall. He will be uh, suffocating, and he will move, and he will not be able to intubate. And if you try to push through the tube, you will cause massive bleeding. And then there is not a uh, then only option is to go for a tracheostomy. Okay. So remember, the secretions are likely to be more. It will be foul smelling at times. There may be super added infection on them. Patient has got irradiation, neck radiation. You have seen that? Patient who has got neck radiation would be very difficult to manage otherwise. Now we are presuming that neck radiation was not given because it is for a biopsy. So until unless biopsy is confirmed, confirmed they will not give neck radiation. So consider these things before you really decide on fiber optic. It is not the gold standard for everything. Fiber optic failure rate is there. And these are one of the cases, supraglottic structures, masses where fiber optic fails. 
thyroid. Another one where it will fail. So don't jump to fiber optic because it has been told to you that this is the ultimate. It is not the ultimate. And the highest failure rates are recorded in these cases only. I have failed in three cases. You're not, not able to do it. Right? So some things are made simpler. Manage it in a simple manner. Assessment is most important. Assessment, preparation and planning. These three things you do not forget. Pre-op assessment where you do the, and then you plan accordingly, and then you prepare the patient accordingly, what you want to do. You must also have a tracheostomy standby. This patient, you will have the ENT surgeon scrubbed up, ready to do a tracheostomy. He should be able to mark the area where he is going to feed it, right? He will even put the local there before you induce the patient. So that if you land up into, cannot ventilate, cannot oxygenate, immediately get the tracheostomy done standing there itself, without interfering too much. This is how you will go about it. Correct? Any questions? As you have said, ki, uh, in a big mass, it's better if, if a patient is obviously breathing, sleeping normally in the previous phase. Uh, in a big mass, you have said ki, it's better to redo the endoscopy also. So, sir, for doing the video you have to sedate the patient. I said inhalational induction. Inhalational induction. Oxygen 100% with sevoflurane. Maintain the airway. To overcome the obstruction, put an esophageal airway. So that you don't have to remove your mask during induction at any time if there is an airway obstruction which can happen. All awake patients would accept an esophageal airway. So put it before induction itself. You put it for post-op recovery when the patient has not recovered. All of them tolerate well. All of them have a nasotric, uh, these nasogastric tubes there. They tolerate well. So even a nasopharyngeal airway, they will tolerate very well. Then you start your induction. So start with 100% oxygen with sevoflurane. Take the patient deep. Correct? And then take the patient deep. When you have achieved a good depth, you can even use a transtracheal to give a local so that all that reflexes which can happen are not there. You can even inject something through the nasopharyngeal airway. Put the fiber optic there, use it as, as, as a channel to spray some, some local onto the cords before they start uh, manipulating it. But it's dangerous. Those patients will have to be intubated because you'll have to wait for the local to go away complete hemostasis to be achieved before you take out the tube later. So it's, it's the planning which you have to done, do with the ENT surgeons together, evaluate together to see what is the effect on the airway. It is not simple. So we cannot tell you what it will be until unless I see the picture. We are only assuming and thinking of what we can do. But if it is something like a strider, suppose this patient comes with strider. Now they have come to you that you please come here for tracheostomy. We want you to be side by, by the patient's side. We want to do an urgent emergency tracheostomy. So what will you do? See a larynx, you want to do a tracheostomy. Patient is in strider and they have called you for help to be a standby. So what is your position or a role as a standby anesthetist? Except apart from praying to God. Who can take this? Yeah. Uh, prepare myself by having tubes of smaller diameter. Yes. Prepare a uh, kit for emergency tricothyroid. They would already have prepared. They want to do an emergency tracheostomy. So they can. You can put the tricothyroid also. Uh, have a rigid bronchoscope with me in case if I lose the airway and we cannot uh, ensure the patency mm -hmm. and. Uh, Fiber optic nothing. nothing. First of all, make sure that the patient is propped up. Okay? You may have to alter the position. Propped up with an extension, but give the position where the patient is more comfortable so that he can withstand. Right? First. Second is 
humidified oxygen. Why humidified oxygen? What does humidified humidification do to the oxygen? Yes, so for it to go across the glottis or a constriction is much easier. It is not as superior to helium, but it is somewhere in between helium and dry oxygen when you give humidified oxygen. So give a high flow of oxygen. You, have, you would have seen the recent guidelines. Everywhere we have mentioned use high flow nasal oxygen, humidified oxygen. So do that. Continuously maintain oxygenation. A little propped up position. What else? Nasopharyngeal airway and Yes, you can give a nasopharyngeal airway, but most of them would be doing under local. They may not be obstructing that. Suppose the patient goes into obstruction, right? They will, you will tell them to go ahead with the tracheostomy. But what will be your role be? Uh, if the surgical team is not able to get a tracheostomy done, then uh, we'll have to find other ways to get in the airway. How? Oh. Okay. So one of them will be to use the uh, uh, smaller size tubes. And it. It's not going to help. Then maybe we can try uh, low frequency jet ventilation. So we'll go for a needle cricothyroidotomy. Yes. That's the, like you said, cricothyroidotomy ready. That should be done before a tracheostomy is attempted. Because you need to oxygenate this patient now. So have the needle tracheostomy, needle cricothyroidotomy done. But how, what will you do with needle tracheostomy? How would you give up oxygen to that? Yes, so you must have a source for jet ventilation. And the one which you need is a high pressure source. It is not going to be an oxygen from the valve outlet or from the machine. It is not going to work. So you need some sort of a high pressure source and it has to be a manual jet kind of a thing which you will have to use. By the time they should be able to do the tracheostomy while you are oxygenating if he goes into complete obstruction. So you'll have to monitor saturation continuously. You may even monitor nasal ETCO2 to take a track of what is happening to the, to the flows. Whether he is expiring out, whether the tidal volume is coming or not. So just put a cannula here, a cannula cover and step on to see the entire CO2, what is happening to the patient. Continuously monitor ox, uh, oxygen saturation. Continuously monitor ECG, they can go into arrhythmias. You never know they will go into VTAC because of hypoxia. So you may have to have a defibrillator ready so that you can give a shock. But here, the algorithm is not ACLS. The algorithm is because of hypoxia. So you have to give oxygen continuously and make sure. At times it is wise, and this is the golden words, at times it is wise with the patient awake, put a cannula and start insufflating the oxygen while they do the tracheostomy. That is the best way of dealing with the situation. If the patient is having obstruction, upper airway obstruction, having a strider, get the cannula here, right in the beginning, before they even start. Start with a low flow of oxygen of about 1 to 2 liters in suppuration. You can still supplement from the, from the mask. But start your transtracheal oxygenation before tracheostomy is attempted. So that you will never land up with a problem where the patient becomes hypoxic. Your above the glottis oxygenation will not help, but not help to that extent. So get a source below the glottis. Start oxygenating. Tell them to do your go ahead with your tracheostomy. So that is what you should be doing when you stand. Am I clear? Okay, we'll go on to the next case.